Uh, my name is Scott Newbold. I'm a member of the biology faculty here at Sheridan College and the Science Museum Lecture Series. Many of you have been here to others, but uh, if you haven't, we have the Museum of Discovery, the Science Museum of Discovery here on the uh, Sheridan College campus. It has lots of paleontological uh, specimens in it. Uh, but for years, we have been hosting different scientists from the local Sheridan area or the region, or even in some cases outside of, uh, outside of Wyoming. And so um, tonight, before we introduce the, the speaker tonight, I wanted to just make you aware of the other lectures coming up in October, November, and December. So the date for October is the 19th, generally on Wednesday nights in the middle of the month is what we shoot for. Um, and it's um, J.P. Cavagelli from the Tate Museum down in Casper uh, talking about the Green River Formation. Then in November, November 9th, uh, Fire Ecologist is going to come and talk about fire, climate change, and forests um, from back in Wisconsin. So he'll be traveling from out of state. That one's November 9th, Jed Mounier. And the final one is someone from um, Sheridan. She's a microbiologist, Stephanie Servetus, on December 7th. All of those are at 7 p.m. in this room. And her title is Researching the Microbiome and Exploration of Microbial Communities. So um, have those on your calendar if you're interested, and we'll post more announcements about them. So now I'll turn it over to Cheyenne Stewart, who's the wildlife biologist coordinator for the Sheridan region of Game and Fish to introduce our speaker. Thank you all for coming and joining us tonight. Um, I'm Cheyenne Stewart and I have the pleasure of introducing Hank Edwards. Um, so, but before introducing him, a little bit of background of why we wanted to participate in this lecture series um, this time of year. So in 2019, we hosted a series of public meetings in Sheridan region and around the state talking about CWD, chronic wasting disease, and gathering input from the public as well as providing information about the disease as we worked on our revised chronic wasting disease management plan. And so part of our goal with this effort with the meeting tonight and tomorrow in Gillette is to continue that conversation. And so we're extremely lucky that Hank has come up um, from Laramie to talk to you guys this evening. He's led uh, the Game and Fish Wildlife Health Lab for over 25 years, and that lab's responsible for disease surveillance in wildlife. Um, they focus a lot on brucellosis, chronic wasting disease, and respiratory diseases in bighorn sheep, but also um, Hank is the person when our field folks see an animal and are wondering what's going on, he's like the first on our speed dial. So he's really um, a great resource to our department, our folks in the field. And just to um, highlight that, he's the only person that has ever received the Wyoming chapter of the Wildlife Society um, Professional of the Year Award two times. So thank you, Hank, for being here. Thank you very much. That was probably a kinder introduction than I deserved. Um, but yes, I'm the chief lab rat uh, for the Wyoming Game Fish Department. Um, and as Cheyenne said, that usually involves dead stuff. So if they've got something dead, then they call me to figure out what to do with it. So I put together at the, at the Sheridan Region's request, a short presentation, it's about 30 slides. The first 10 is gonna be just a background of chronic wasting disease. For those of you who have heard Hank talk before, this is gonna be the same kind of basic slides. It's a very quick rundown of the disease itself. The next 10 slides, we're gonna talk about CWD in Wyoming mule deer, what we're seeing, what different prevalences are. As Cheyenne mentioned, I have several different examples of prevalences in our local herds here in Sheridan. I have a few slides on chronic wasting disease in elk in Wyoming, and then I wrap it up with where we're headed in the future. This is a really depressing presentation. I'm gonna give you that right up front. There's not a lot of good news here, but um, I think as we're going on with this presentation, keep in mind that it's not all doom and gloom. 
The reason I'm here is to provide some awareness to all of you about what chronic wasting disease is and what it can mean for our, our deer herds in the future. And I like to flea bop around, so I'm gonna be jumping back and forth. So that's really distracting, just yell at me. What is chronic wasting disease? Chronic wasting disease is a fatal nervous system disease of mule deer, white-tailed deer, elk, moose, reindeer, and caribou. It's caused by a prion or an infectious protein, much different than what we're used to, right? It's not a bacteria, it's not a virus, it's a protein. Similar diseases include BSE or mad cow disease of cattle, scrapie in sheep, and crutzfeld jakob disease or kuru in humans. That's a short list. The list of prion diseases in different animals is this long. There's many, many, many out there. The thing about prion diseases, they are very specific for species. There isn't a lot of them that cross many different species. Um, like I said, chronic wasting disease is very specific for cervids. We don't see it go to cattle. We don't see it go to bighorn sheep. We don't see it go to, pre, uh, to um, bighorn sheep or pronghorn or anything else. Very specific. So what exactly is a prion? Um, a prion is an abnormal form of a protein that occurs in our central nervous system. So predominantly in the brain <clears throat> and other nervous system cells, it looks like this. But when this comes in contact with this, this abnormal form, it changes its shape. And when it changes its shape, just think of a folding chair. These don't fold, but those in the back do, I guess. But just think of that. If it folds up, when it changes its shape, everything changes. So that, that shape is now incredibly resistant to the common disinfectants that we use for, for bacteria and viruses, heat, desiccation, all those things that we think about that kill a bacteria or virus no longer kill this. And it's all because it's shape. So the ability for this to force this shape is very, very specific. That's why these are very species specific. It needs the exact folding chair to force its shape, to force its shape change. Does that make sense? So the problem is these become so resistant, they also become resistant for the body to get rid of them. So they build up and they build up and they build up. The body can't get rid of them. And eventually it causes the death of those neural cells. So as more and more of those cells die, then we start to see those classic signs that we associate with chronic wasting disease. The weight loss, drooling, behavioral changes, hair coat changes, droopy ears, just the lack of general awareness, right? The lights are on, but nobody's home is a really good way to describe it. The funny thing is, is this disease can go on for a year and a half, two years, and even longer, but it's not until the last month, maybe two months, that these diseases, that these signs occur. Prior to that, they appear completely normal, and you really can't tell a positive animal from a negative animal. So for those sportsmen who harvest a deer and they look at it and they open it up and there's lots of fat and they go, oh good, I don't have to worry about chronic wasting disease. No, they can be in very good body condition and look completely normal. You just can't tell until these last, these last uh, stages of the disease. But of course, there's lots of diseases that'll have these same signs. So you can't always tell there either, but that's a, that's a pretty good hallmark, particularly that last one of of lack of general awareness. Okay, more about the disease itself. We know that CWD can be transmitted animal to animal, as well as environment to animal, which is a big thing. So as animals ingest uh, contaminated soil, plants, hay, anything that's contaminated with saliva, urine, and feces, we know that animals that are infected with CWD uh, spread most prions through the saliva, followed by um, feces followed by urine. So saliva happens to have a lot of those prions in it. But animals can also pick up this disease when they come in contact with contaminated hard surfaces like mineral licks or anything else that's say out in the pasture. Um, we know that carcasses can spread this disease, right? We know there's a lot of prions in that central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. So as that as that um, uh, animal slowly decomposes into the body or into the soil, sorry, 
um, those prions are still available. So we know that at least with scrapie, those prions can persist in the environment for at least 16 years. So where a deer dies is a hot spot for prions. Doesn't mean they're always available for the deer, right? The deer are gonna come and eat the dirt and stuff like that, but they're certainly available for animals to become infected. As far as sex and age goes, we know that CWD is most common in bucks, and we know that it's most common in prime age animals. So those animals that are three, four, five, six years old are most likely to have CWD as opposed to those that are seven or even two. Um, so it's most common in bucks, most common in prime age animals. True for elk also, most common in prime age animals, but we don't see a separation between sexes and elk. We see an equal distribution between cows and bulls. Genetics, genetics certainly influence the length of the time an animal survives with the disease. So the length of the incubation period is determined by genetics. That said, most deer will die within two years and most elk will die within four years. That can be extended in deer, say to three years, and elk can actually be extended out to eight years. So they can live for a very long time. It's rare to find animals that will survive to eight years. Usually it's closer to six, but the vast majority will die in four. There's no true resistance identified. So there's no perfect genotype that will completely resist infection. There's no documented immunity or recovery. Remember, this is just a change of cells in the brain. It, the body doesn't recognize it like it would a virus or a bacteria. It's just a slow flip of those of those uh, prion proteins. So the body doesn't recognize that anything's going wrong since until it's really too late. All cervids are susceptible regardless of nutrition or health status. Again, it's not like having the flu, whereas if you're in good shape, maybe you won't get as affected as much. Um, there's just nothing out there that we've seen so far that prevents animals from coming down with the disease. For CWD and predators, um, it's been shown that mountain lions selectively prey on CWD infected animals. Um, and there's been research to show that most of those prions are actually deactivated as they go through the digestive tract, but not all of them. A lot of them are, but not all. And modeling suggests that wolves, if they're able to key in on those animals in the early part of the, of the incubation period and remove them from the population early, then um, they may actually decrease prevalence, right? Because the, the key is because these animals are shedding prions in their urine and their feces, their saliva, the sooner you get them off the landscape, the less environmental contamination there is, the less animals that can become infected. That's why predators are so, could be so key to this disease. Um, as far as CWD and human health, there's been a ton of studies out there um, and it's actually, it's right down the middle of the road as far as a gray area goes. There's an equal number of studies that says this disease will go to humans as there is to say it's not gonna go to humans. But basically uh, there, it appears that there is a pretty substantial species barrier, but that barrier is probably not absolute. Um, there's been one ongoing study, which unfortunately has not been published yet, where they fed macaques um, meat from positive deer, and those macaques did come down with CWD. But until that study gets published, this is really all we can say, whether this is valid or not. Um, the, the Department of Health and the CDC has been looking at this for a long, long time, and they constantly monitor the death of people if there's uh, central nervous system disease, they try and link it back to the consumption of CWD positive animals. And to date, there's been no link um, with the consumption of CWD positive animals and um, uh, some of those diseases like crutzfeldt jakob disease and, and stuff like that. So nonetheless, wisely so, CDC and the World Health Organization both recommend that positive animals not be consumed. The prion is not inactivated by cooking and it's just smart to minimize human exposure to those prions, right? Don't push the envelope, basically. Prion can be, can be inactivated by soaking your butchering equipment in 40% bleach. Um, that's still pretty caustic. 
So if you've got a really nice knife that you like, beware, this is likely to rust it. But 40% bleach in, uh, for five minutes will inactivate the prion. All right, you've survived those 10 slides. Move on to CWD in deer in Wyoming. Um, we really don't know when this disease appeared in the state. Um, modeling suggests it was probably here since the 1950s. This is a really slow disease and it can slowly percolate along for 20, 30, 40 years before prevalence gets high enough that we can detect it. And that's probably what occurred. And that's why they say it's probably since the 50s. We documented it in, in free range of mule deer in 1985, elk in 86, white-tailed deer in 1990, and moose in 2008. So we have not found CWD in another moose since that first one in 2008, as far as free-ranging animals are concerned. So this presentation is gonna be focused on deer and elk. We just have not seen CWD in moose yet. As far as our surveillance program, um, again, we've been doing this for a very long time, over 25 years. Um, uh, during those early years of surveillance, it was kind of happenstance to where we had resources, to where we had concerns. Uh, a couple of years ago, we changed that. So now we're gonna hit every, almost every mule deer and, and elk herd across the state, and we do that every five years. Um, we still offer free testing statewide. We do that at regional offices and check stations, uh, and we try and turn those samples around back to the hunter within three weeks. Um, and those results are now available on the website, both positive and negative. If you just log into your account, those results will be available. So this is what it looks like um, as far as prevalence across the state. So think about this. Like I mentioned, we started here in the early 2000s. It's taken 20, 30 years, slowly across, slowly across the entire state. So now CWD occurs in 34 of our 37 mule deer herd units. So just about everywhere. So I know it's probably difficult for, to see, particularly in the back, but that darkest area, which is there in the project, that prevalence is over 50% move to Goshen Rim, that color is between 25 and 50. Next one's 10 to 25, so these are all 10 to 25, up in your neck of the woods, um, five to 10, some of these lighter colors, and finally zero to five, Wyoming Rain, Sublet, Sweetwater, and then not detected is that very blue color there and there, and some up there. So what we see, is in those areas, particularly those that are in the dark, darkest blue, is that as prevalence increases, the proportion of class two bucks, which is antler spread of 20 to 25 inches, and class three bucks, which is greater than 25 inches, those are inversely proportional, right? So as we're using the same scale here, which is zero to 70, so this is proportion of class two and class three bucks. This is CWD prevalence. So as you move across the state, that project herd is where I showed you, that's actually at about 65% prevalence. Has the lowest or almost the lowest as opposed to Bates Hole, the number of class two and class three bucks. And that's because infected deer only live about two years, remember? So, those deer just are not living long enough to reach those class two and class three um, sizes. But it's not just the males, right? Both males and females are equally susceptible to this disease. And what we find is, is as prevalence increases and as the longer prevalence has been elevated, then the more and more females get infected in a herd. And that's worrisome. And this was shown, this was a study from 2010 to 2014 in the South Converse mule deer herd. So it's just south of Douglas. At the time of this study, the prevalence was about 44%. The leading causes of mortality in that herd were mountain lion predation. Remember that CWD positive animals are more likely to get predated on by lions. 
and clinical CWD. So adult female survival in that herd, if they were CWD negative, was 76%. So they had a 76% chance of living from year to year. But if you were CWD positive, you had a 32% chance of living year to year. So really, you want this to be above 80, to have a good stable herd, right around 80, 81, 82, something like that. So there's other things going on. It's not just CWD that's driving this. It looks that way as you see the prevalence increase and population decreases. There's other things going on here from drought and predation. There's tons of factors that affect how well a mule deer herd behaves or performs, if you will. CWD is just one of those things. And obviously at low prevalence, less effect. Higher prevalence, much more effect, as is seen here with only 32% survival. This is just another way to put this, and Zach put this together for me. Um, this prevalence here doesn't follow this scale. It's about 17, 18%, but it shows how CWD prevalence is increasing, populations are decreasing, and the days to harvest is increasing, which makes sense, right? Fewer deer out there. And again, this is not to say that this directly relates to population. You can see there's lots of things that are happening with this population, but it's one more straw on the camel's back that affects that population. All right, <laughs> so now I've thrown together just a few prevalences from some of your local herds so you can get an idea of what you're looking at. And I'll try and go through this particularly later in some of the herds, how we look at it from, from our lab rat view about what might be going on. So almost all of our statistics are based on adult mule deer. They're the ones that are most likely to have it. And it gives us a standard metric that we can compare all our herds across the state. So almost all of our, our statistics are gonna be solely based on this. And you'll notice that's our highest sample sizes, which makes sense. That's mostly what we kill, right? It's adult deer. So this runs from 2017 to 2021. All these graphs are gonna be this way from here on out. We try and get our 200 samples from each herd unit within three years. That's our goal, but we do it every five years. So this is gonna be in five year increments. So male mule deer, 574, 81 positive. We're sitting at 14%. So this is a 95% confidence interval. And what that all that tells us is we have a 95% confidence that the true prevalence is somewhere between 9.9% and 17.2%. So what's interesting about this figure, and you'll see this if you pay attention as I go through these graphs, as prevalence increases, this gets wider. Because as you get closer to 50%, then it gets then it's a random thing, like a coin toss, right? It takes a lot more samples. Lower sample size, this will be a tighter figure. So, um, Pata River mule deer herd, this is hunt, deer hunt area 17, 18, 23, and 26. So, as I said, adult female mule deer is about half what it is in adult male deer. But look at white tail deer in this herd unit. 181 samples for 38.7%, and adult female white tailed deer were at 20.9%. Pretty, pretty high prevalences. For the pumpkin buttes, almost the same prevalence, 14.2% with 183 samples. But I've highlighted these in red because those are really small sample sizes. Those, you, you really can't draw any conclusions from those. They're just too small. Just view them as it gives you an idea of what might be going on. But really, our sample sizes are small. Um, with only 13 female uh, uh, mule deer, you can't say much. But white-tailed deer sitting at about 25%. Female white-tailed deer at about 17.5. Again, small sample sizes. Okay. Now this one I included yearly male mule deer as well as yearly male white-tailed deer. Those weren't the previous ones because we just didn't have the sample sizes. Um, so 
This is the North Bighorn uh, herd unit. So areas 24, 25, 27, 28, 50, 51, 52, and 53. So 319 samples, we're sitting at 11%. But look at your yearly male mule deer, we're at 5.8%. That's worrisome, that's worrisome. That means that that disease is starting to affect those younger animals. Um, adult female mule deer at 10.4, but look at the white tail at 23.8. Um, yearly males at 12.5, very similar to adult females, 12.6. So that's a concern. Again, we're starting to affect those younger animals. Any questions on this before I go on? I just think this is all crazy. Sometimes I think this is all crazy. Um, upper Powder River mule deer herd, areas 30, 32, 33. 163 and 169. Again, small sample sizes. Um, adult mule deer, 406, which is actually quite good. It's a prevalence of 17.7. Yearling male mule deer, again, worrisome at 6.8. Female mule deer, 6.7, that's the same. Um, male white tailed deer, 42%. Small sample size of 50. So 50 is going to give you about and I'm guessing here about an 80% confidence interval, so not 95. And then adult female white tailed deer, 25%. Again, very small sample size. Any questions on that before I jumped elk? I just got a few. When you use the term prevalence, does that mean you just um, were able to identify the prion in an animal, or do you see the effects of it? That means, that's a really good question. That means that 44 out of, or 406, 72 tested positive on our ELISA test. Most of the, all of these are hunter killed animals. So um, unless the hunters specified that the animal was thin or acting strange, these were normal animals. Good question. CWD in Wyoming's elk. So, there's a lot fewer elk herds that are infected with CWD in comparison to deer. So only 15 of our 36 elk herds are infected. Nonetheless, we identify between three and five new hunt areas. I said herds there and that's wrong. 33 to five hunt areas uh, are identified new each year with CWD. Most herds are currently below 6% prevalence the exception is the Iron Mountain herd, which is in southeastern Wyoming, is sitting at 13%. Other states, though, particularly South Dakota, are not as lucky. They have a lot higher prevalences. Wind Cave National Park is sitting at 13.9, very similar to Iron Mountain. And Custer State Park um, has a herd that's at 28%. So certainly elk are just as susceptible, uh, but for whatever reason, ours uh, we have a lower prevalence. And the same is observed in Colorado. Most of their prevalences are low as well. I think they have one, their highest is around 8%. So um, stays pretty low. That said, it's a whole different beast when we talk about CWD on feed grounds. Because CWD on feed grounds, as those animals are in very close, high dense uh, concentrations, disease transmission could be very, very high. So we're really, concerned about CWD on feed grounds and actually we're currently drafting our feed ground management plan and uh, CWD as you can imagine is a major part of that plan. Same kind of map but a much different scale. So 10 to 15 percent that's our Iron Mountain and we move to our Laramie Peak herd at 5 to 10. Um, the next color is 3 to 5. So you can see your South Bighorn, North Bighorn, and then a zero to three, most of those um, herd units off towards the western half of the state. It's interesting how, at least with the Laramie Peak herd, that herd, um, we identified it in 2002, prevalence was very low. You saw that prevalence climb right up to around 5%, and it has essentially stayed there through all this time. We see some ups and downs, of course, for the most part, it stayed right around 5%. Not the case in our Iron Mountain herd. We're, you know, we're almost 14% there now. Um, for your neck of the woods, I threw up CWD prevalence in the North Bighorn Elk Herd. 
So this is uh, Hunter is 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40. Um, remember, this is adult males and female elk that are thrown into this. We've looked at 293. 13 of those have tested positive. So our prevalence is 4.4%. All right. Now just a few slides to kind of wrap up why we're worried about CWD. Why am I standing here? So as I mentioned, 34 of our 37 mule deer herds are infected with CWD. And in six of those herds, prevalence exceeds 30% in males. And the average female prevalence in those herds is 14%. Over the past 10 years, statewide CWD prevalence has increased 13% each year in mule deer, 22% in white-tailed deer, and 11% a year in elk, but only in the Iron Mountain herd. So CWD and prevalence in male mule deer near pavilion is 65%, like I've mentioned many times up here. Females is 24%. So put that into context. We know the deer live two years. So what is that? 32% of our deer are going to die a year of CWD, either directly or indirectly. 12% of our females are going to die of CWD each year directly or indirectly. So that is really hard. It's hard to kind of wrap your mind around about how these populations can persist on the landscape. And certainly we're not the worst. Up in Saskatchewan, they recently had a deer herd that reported 87% prevalence. And 34%, I don't remember, I think it's 34% females. So wrap your head around that. Holy smoly, how can that deer herd persist on the landscape? It's pretty rough. So over time, CWD slowly changes deer herds, right? Like I mentioned, CWD affects prime age animals, but as prevalence increases, animals become affected at younger and younger ages. So we have more and more deer dying at younger and younger ages. And because CWD positives, animals only live for two years, the average age of the herd shifts because there just isn't any older animals. And older animals become rare. Well, females are the foundation of the herd, right? So as prevalence increases and more and more females become infected, the reproduction growth and resilience of the herd is constrained. So if you go back to that graph I had of, of the South Converse herd where you saw the prevalence increase and the population decrease, as I mentioned, there's many things that, that affect that. But when things get good and they get lots of rain and all of a sudden there's deer fat and healthy, fat and healthy and happy, even though they may have CWD, remember they can live for a while, but those herds with CWD respond very, very slowly. They don't bounce back like our low prevalence or our negative herds, just because there isn't enough prime age animals that are prime reproductive that can carry that herd forward. Makes sense. Okay, finally, ground disposition on the landscape increases with prevalence, increasing the likelihood of disease transmission from the environment. This is why we don't want to say uh, once we get to 87% prevalence, then we'll do something. Because as prions continue to build up in the environment, your ability to do anything is kind of taken away, right? You're not going to scrape all the dirt away and bring in new deer. You're not going to be able to do that. So I think that once prions build up to the environment to the point where there's a lot of environmental transmission, your hands are kind of tied on how you're going to deal with this disease. All right. So the depression should be over. I'm not going to lift all the clouds, but at least some of the clouds. What are we doing? So I think... I can honestly say that 10 years ago, I would never be up here talking like I'm talking right now. 10 years ago, I would have said CWD is just a weird disease. We don't see it that often. It's no big deal. We've come a long ways. We know that this disease is a big deal. And I think the department, although we honestly, I wouldn't say we ignored it. We just chose to not do anything about it. And that's changing. We're turning things around, trying to you know, get people aware, as I'm standing up here today, 
and uh, move on with maybe some management actions in areas of the state where we're able to. So part of that is public education. Um, on our website, there is a ton of information on our website. And if you don't find what you want on our website, get a hold of me. I've got a stack of journal articles this big, and I will more than happy send you whatever you're interested in. Social media releases, news releases, public meetings like this. Um, increased surveillance, like I mentioned, across the state. We've in instituted carcass transport regulations. Those are available online. And the main reason we did that is to try and prevent improper disposal of carcasses, right? We don't want people driving out to the BLM uh, sections, kicking out their parts and driving off. We want people to put it into a dumpster and properly dispose of it because we want to limit that disease transmission. We're working with municipal landfills for other disposal options. Cheyenne certainly done a ton of that, trying to get dumpsters out on the landscape. Again, making it easy for sportsmen to discard their, their remains. We've updated our CWD management plan. That management plan was developed using uh, a ton of scientific data, as well as public and agency, or, uh, agency input. And that plan is really just a menu of different management options. There's no prescriptive um, uh, advice that, that anybody should apply to all herds across the state. It's all going to be very herd specific developed at the local level, right? Because you saw that all those herds that are in your neck of the woods, each herd's responding a little bit differently. So you're going to have to apply different management actions, whatever those may be, um, um, to, to your herd very specific. So what can you guys do, right? Encourage hunting and testing of harvested deer, elk, and moose. Don't quit hunting. I think if you enjoy hunting, don't let CWD uh, change your mind. Proper disposal of carcasses and parts after processing, especially the brain and spinal cord. All of it, not just the brain and spinal cord, but especially the brain and spinal cord. Get involved with Wyoming Game, Game and Fish and local deer and elk management. Come to the season setting meetings, get involved if they should get the CWD working group together, learn about CWD just like you are now. This is gonna be a huge lift for the department as well as for um, the public. And finally, keep an open mind and patience for CWD management actions. This is really a slow disease. It takes a long time for animals to become infected and to die. So if you change any management action and hope to see some results, well, it takes a while to cycle through the system. And if that, that's gonna be at least five years, maybe longer than that, before we know if those management actions are making any difference. Okay, you survived a hang talk. So, any questions I can answer? Any? Oh, come on, it wasn't that bad, was it? Sir? I have an opinion that printers have a hard hard time or uh, increase the losses because they concentrate these animals in the, into local units and spread the disease faster because of Maybe. response. It's also been thought that there's an increase in predators, particularly mountain lions, as, as Colorado found, because there's so much game to eat. You have, you have high prevalence in your deer population, lots of food, and that actually increases the predation pressure. As far as pushing animals around and spreading it, that's, that is certainly possible. I think the predators can also spread it through their scat, right? We get rid of some prions, but we don't get rid of all. Which is more important in the grand scheme of things, as far as getting animals off the landscape before they continue continue to uh, spread prions, and more importantly, consume that carcass and at least decrease the, the prion load? I don't know. I, I think that's probably herd by herd, how much predation pressure there is and what the prevalence is. I'm not sure I'm smart enough to figure that out. I'd have to sit down and really think about that. Did I answer your question at all, or did I completely dance around it? No, I danced a little bit, but you did good. <laughs> 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 oh. Hank, so we encountered a pretty significant epizootic hemorrhagic disease outbreak last year, and we're, we're having a localized one. 
Do you think that might influence CWD problems in our white tail deer herd in the Sheridan area? That's a really good question. Chance they get mature buck white tails more severe. Or what, what, how do you think that's going to interact between those two different diseases? It's really interesting. And I'm going to go back, drag all you guys through this again. If you look at those maps that I showed. So we detected CWD in the early 2000s here in the Black Hills. And yet that prevalence stayed very low for a number of years. It's just starting to creep up. I think we're around 8%. Prior to that, we were 2% for like 20 years. Now, there's a couple things that could be going on. This goes off of Tim's question. It may very well be that whenever there's an EHD outbreak, which should happen about every seven to 10 years, we're resetting the clock, right? We're taking all those infected animals or most of them, or at least some of them, taking them off the, the landscape. So the disease is not being transmitted. The other thing is, is there's a very interesting interaction with prions and soils, and prions tend to, tend to bind and actually become more effective in bentonite-type soils. This is more granitic up here as opposed to down here. Um, that could have something to do with it. It's probably all things happen to do with it. And it may very well be that our harvest regimen of our um, Hunt Area 7 elk, which is a Laramie Peak, we harvest, what, about 20% of those elk a year thereabouts? I don't know exactly. You should never ever have a lab rat tell you what the harvest rate is. But anyway, there's a tremendous turnover in those animals every year. And we may be doing exactly the same thing. We're taking enough of those animals off the landscape every year that that prevalence is being maintained and not taken off. And same is true for our deer herds, I'm sure, right? Hunters are taking those animals out uh, of, the, of the population. We know that, that CWD positive animals are more likely to get hit by a car, like I mentioned, more likely to get, um, uh, more likely to get harvested by a hunter, um, and especially if you're a bow hunter, right? So if that animal is just a little bit slower for just a few more seconds, so all those are probably having an effect on our population to some degree. How much? I don't know. So to answer your question, I went down a huge rabbit hole for a very quick answer. Yes, I think it's going to make a difference. I think that those uh, EHD outbreaks definitely make a difference in getting those positives off the landscape. What's something that a, <clears throat> that a landowner could do to kind of decrease the transmission and also what what could a landowner do to help you guys in your research other than um, just encourage their hunters to get their animals tested? That, that sir is a fantastic question <clears throat> and I think that as landowners you need to look for things that are likely to be sources of environmental transmission so a good example is, and I know we don't raise a lot of wheat here, but it's been showing up in Canada that leaky grain bins are a great source of CWD transmission because those deer are hitting the same pile as it's spilling out of the bin night after night after night after night. Um, there's been some areas in Wheatland where we've looked at like silage piles and things like that, where deer come into the same area. Is there a way that either we can, we can um, distribute those deer or if there's certain fields that both deer or, or whatever really congregate on, can we target our hunting pressure on those areas in specifically and try and disperse those animals as much as we can? Hunting seasons are short, they're not 12 months long, but are there some things to do? As far as what you could do to help our research, you know, I think as we go on, a lot of what we try and do is not only determine prevalence, but also determine hotspots goes back to what I just mentioned with, with animals that tend to come from a very specific area. So all of our air, all of our samples that we test have harvest locations, and then we map those. Can we identify certain hot spots um, that we need to target our, our pressure on? So getting your hunters um, to submit samples, super.
once a prion is in an animal, is much known about how that protein is reproduced or modified? What goes on biologically in that animal? That's a good question. I don't know that I really know the answer to that question. Um, certainly, we find that prions are distributed throughout the body wherever there's a blood supply. So, and we know that normal cellular prions occur throughout the body. They're most common in the brain and central nervous system, but they're spread throughout the body. And I would imagine, I'm really not the person to ask this, but my thought is probably what's happening is there's a conversion that's happening throughout the body, throughout the life of the animal until they finally die of converting normal to abnormal forms. It's just in different amounts depending on where that prion happens to be. But as far as I know, once that prion has converted to the abnormal shape, it stays that abnormal shape. Well, and that was kind of a follow-up. If, if I understand you, that prion, once it exits the animal, can stay in the environment, in soil or whatever, for a long period of time. At least 16 years. What protects the integrity of that? It's not a living It's not structure. a living thing, that's right. There's no DNA, there's no RNA. It's, it's so different than anything that we're used to, but it's that shape. And somehow, which I can't explain, but that shape protects it from uh, environmental degradation, bacterial degradation. It's not 100%, certainly, as you can see as it passed through a mountain lion gut. It's susceptible to some things. And it's probably susceptible because it's been shown in compost. The compost will drastically reduce the number of prions, but it won't get them all. And that's the key. We're, we're decreasing the load, but they're always going to still be there to some degree. And they certainly become unavailable on the, on the environment, right? Through, you know, rains and mechanical bearing, whatever it may be. Um, we know that they're not always available to deer. Got a couple of questions online. That I can read out. So, first one from Tom Does uh, Wyoming Game and Fish believe that CWD will run its course and disappear, or will it be a chronic disease that will be with us for the long term? Unfortunately, I think that chronic waste and disease is going to be here for the long term because I don't see an end. In other words, I don't see it running its course because. The prion can persist in the environment for a long time. And um, to even, it, let's say we were to kill all the deer and bring new in, it wouldn't solve the problem, right? So I think the CWD is here to stay. I think we just need to figure out how to manage it and, and keep those prevalence levels at a, at a biologically survivable level, if that, if that makes any sense. Great. Uh, another one from Tyler. So with the EHD outbreak in Sheridan around my area, we have seen multiple dead white-tailed deer. How can we remove the animals in conjunction with game and fish to prevent the prions getting into soil with those multiple decaying bodies? Good question. The best thing to do is dispose of them in the landfill. I don't know. I know that certain or that livestock producers are able to bury a certain number on their property but that's out of my wheelhouse by quite a bit. But the best thing to do is probably bury those animals and get them off the landscape. Another one, can you test CWD and shed it antler? Lurch. There are, uh, we don't have the capability yet, but there is a test that's coming online that is extremely sensitive. And I believe they can test antlers. They certainly have found prions in velvet, um, I don't know if they found it in antlers yet, but uh, again, any tissue that has a blood supply or had a blood supply um, should have prions there. So that test is coming. All right, I've got one more there and then we can see if there are other questions in the room. Uh, is Game and Fish doing anything as far as educating our younger future generations about what's going on? There's a lot of young faces in here. Mm -hmm. So, that's a really good question because the people who come to our meetings, season setting meetings, tend to be the older set, like myself, not the younger set. So um, 
Reaching the younger set, I think, is a challenge, but through the use of social media and some of the other aspects that, that the department is trying, we're, we're doing our best to reach the younger folks. How effective we are at doing it, um, that's yet to be known. Well, how many of you young people knew about CWD before you came here? At least knew what it meant. So most of you. So we're doing okay. <laughs> Tina. Um, just seeing so you know, it, uh, we have started including, at least locally here, the Hunter Education class that I'm involved in, which tend to be the younger students. I have been talking about CD and what it is, how to get the animals tested, things like that. So I think statewide, they're looking at incorporating more of that into the Hunter Ed curriculum. Good. Any other questions for Hank here? Just a comment. I, you know, I advocate getting our hunters to keep coming. Our hunters with us. I think. Because of uh, spend all this money to you know travel from ten buck to out here and then end up. Uh, and pay for processing and, and one thing or another and then end up with a landfill. We don't have a big place. We tip, most years we'll have from seven to eight hunters and probably I'd say a 40% success rate. And I'm guessing three-fourths of those deer test positive. Yeah, and that's a worry for, for me as well because like I said, I think the way we're doing it right now we're having an effect on prevalence, right? We're removing them, removing some of those positives. But we can continue to expect hunters to do it. Think about hunting in Pavilion or up in Saskatchewan. Why would you do that? Yeah. Has there been any research done on the factors that contribute to the deactivation through the predation and like maybe any ways to replicate that in the environment? I don't know that I've seen research that, whether it's a, an effect of the stomach acid or, or other things, enzymes, I, I don't know the answer to that question. What, what was the question? The question was, has there been research that's been done on the ways that prion are deactivated as they pass through the digestive tract? And could we use some of the knowledge to, to maybe apply that to the field? I may have put a few words in your mouth there. <laughs> And the answer was, yeah, I just, I just don't know of, of that research off the top of my head. Cheyenne? I just to we are and have been doing research at its, our, our uh, wildlife research unit, which is um, in the Sabeel Canyon, about 50 miles outside of Laramie. We've been doing several studies. One of those is and this is probably gonna get a little farther in the weeds than you guys wanna get, so just hold on. And that is, we know that with, particularly with elk, there's three genotypes, MMs, MLs, and LLs. MMs die three and a half, four years. MLs live about four and a half, five years. LLs can live eight years, six to eight years. So we wanna know, because certainly we've seen through a lot of research, that those herds that are chronically exposed to um, prions, that there is a very slow shift to those genotypes that have a longer incubation period. Makes sense, right? They live a little bit longer, they have a few extra cows. So one of the things we wanna know is, is that a bad thing? If you have an LL elk that lived the longest and they're infected, are they spreading prions for another four years as opposed to an MM? which is gonna get it and die. So that's one of the things we're doing. Second thing we're doing is trying to figure out CWD vaccines, not figure out, we are not smart enough. We are providing the facility for researchers, mostly from Canada, that are designing um, vaccines to hopefully combat CWD. And it's really interesting. The first one they came up with, all the vaccinates died about three, four months earlier than the controls which were not vaccinated. So that didn't work. So now we've come back 
and they've tried a new vaccine and all they're trying, all they're trying to see is do the elk respond to it and produce antibodies? Is there an immune response to this vaccine? And it turns out there's a huge response, but that's a huge step to, is it protective? We have not got that far yet. It's the tough part about our research unit is it's got a lot of prions in the environment. So when you bring in animals, they automatically are infected. So ideally with vaccines, you vaccinate and then you expose. We just haven't been able to do that in our research facility because when you bring them in, they're exposed and then you vaccinate, it's not as, it's not as nice. What else are we doing at our research facility as far as CWD? Those are the two latest ones. We've done CWD research there for 25 years um, or better, but those are the most recent ones. What's that? Ear punches and other, oh, ear punches, talked about yes. it with antlers, but maybe you can talk more right, about yeah. other diagnoses. When you guys have had enough, please leave. You don't have to sit here and listen to me, Gabbert. Trying to detect CWD in live animals we capture them for research studies, right? It would be really cool if we could figure out if they had CWD when we captured them, because then we could follow them and see how things change, you know, if they act a little bit differently, if they, you know, have their, their young in different areas, all kinds of different things we'd like to know. So the problem is, is prions are really tough to detect in live animals. It's not a test thing, it's a sample thing, because those prions, at least in deer, tend to localize in the lymph nodes, the retropharyngeal lymph nodes first, as well as the tonsils first, less to other lymphoid tissues in the body. So trying to find a good sample to test to see if the animal has CWD is really hard. So some researchers, I can't remember exactly where they're out of, found that if you take a punch out of the ear, that that can be really sensitive in, deter in detecting CWD. But unfortunately, where these researchers had done their work is right on the main nerve and vessel that goes up through the center of the, of the, of the um, ear. So it isn't something you wanna do to a live deer. We don't need basset hounds running around that look like deer, so, or vice versa, I should say. So we are working with the University of Wyoming right now to try and see, can you get away from that nerve and still detect CWD? So this is only a five millimeter hole that you would put into their ear. And then we run it through that real sensitive test that we was talking about with the antlers. It's called RT Quick. And um, hopefully we'll be able to, to um, use ears as a good way to identify CWD positive animals. But we're not there yet. Nobody is. There's really no good samples that we found yet. One more question online if we can. Let's one here. So interesting one, can animals be born with CWD? Can they be infected via breeding? Um, it's, they have looked at uh, fetuses and they have found prions in different fetuses. I think they've looked at elk, they've looked at mujak deer, maybe and white-tailed deer, and they found prions there. But based on our findings in Wyoming, we don't think that is a major um, source of transmission, nor is breeding. And I say that because, again, remember most deer will live only two years, but of prime age animals from the three, five, and six year olds tend to be the ones that have CWD. So that tells us it's probably something in the behavior, particularly since it's bucks, it's something in their behavior, whether it be breeding or whether it be bachelor groups or what it is that they're passing that disease amongst themselves as opposed to being born with it, um, if that makes sense, or breeding. Great. Well, I'm sure if you've got a burning question, you can hang around for a minute, but uh, let's thank Hank for the talk tonight. Appreciate it.